told why I'm um, kind of working with an editor on it, and perhaps you guys can help me at some point. Um, but uh, so thanks so much uh, for inviting me. I really look forward. And please do interrupt me throughout uh, the seminar. I, I, uh, yeah, I think it will be fine because it's a relatively small group, so it's perfectly fine if you interrupt me uh, during the next hour or so. So um, this is a long title, and this is a paper about innovation with uh, uh, in in the world of high tech. And so, um, in case you didn't know, for for quite some time, and as Alexander was uh, mentioning just a minute ago, for quite some time, the Department of Justice has been preparing. Uh, to initiate a suit against Google. And I talked to um, uh, Barr the other day and I said, listen, could you delay the announcement because I'm giving this seminar at AMATS and uh, it would be, be nice if uh, the announcement were made just a few hours before the seminar. And he said, okay, I'll wait for another couple of weeks. So if you uh, see people asking, what about the timing? Why the timing of this announcement of the suit? Well, it's because of the seminar basically that um, we agreed to, um, uh, shift the announcement to the day before the seminar. Okay, not everything that I just told you is true, but it's an interesting story nevertheless. So uh, this is, I believe, a very topical topic, the whole issue of um, how to deal with high tech, in particular in the context of, of innovation. And so, I mean, if you pretend to give a paper, a theoretical paper on innovation, it's incumbent on you to explain, tell me something I don't know. Uh, and I'm, I'm aware of that, and I'm aware of that responsibility of, of trying to explain to you what it is that I have in here that we don't know. And in fact, I'm going to go through a fairly long introduction, beginning with, you know, some received wisdom regarding innovation. And apologies for those of you who are familiar with the literature. This is going to sound like Econ 101 almost. But I think it's useful to go through this so as to set the stage of what is it that I have to say that I claim to be, at least to some extent, new. Uh, and so also as preparation for that stage, I will talk about innovation specifically in so-called digital industries, by which I mean, you know, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, Twitter, and so forth. And then I will go uh, to the model and the results, so this will be the core of the paper, and, and, and um, spend some time also in concluding remarks, both talking about some empirical evidence I know this is a theory uh, talk, but I think it's kind of helpful to uh, tell you a little bit about the empirical evidence and uh, policy implications, including for um, you know the case, the suit, probably one of the biggest uh, antitrust cases in the past uh, 30 years that has just been initiated today. I mean, today in the US, <clears throat> yesterday for you guys. Okay, so that's sort of the plan. Uh, and as I said, please do interrupt me uh, anytime if you would like. So. Here's by means of introduction, some received wisdom regarding innovation and um, uh, in, in, a, in just a, a couple of slides and in a, just a couple of minutes, I will summarize about a hundred years of economics research. Now that's a daunting task. So it will be a very selective, very selective summary <clears throat> of prior theory. And I will summarize it in the form of three key ideas which I will put in the form of effects. It's gonna be very focused in the IO, IO tradition. In other words, market structure and firm size. So three, three ideas only. And I'm doing this because then I will build, on, I will build my model and my results on, on top of these and I will make a frequent reference to these effects. So they will uh, appear and reappear um, in a remainder of, of the presentation. So, at the cost of telling you what you already know very well, at the cost of telling you the obvious, uh, please forgive me for that, but I think I will uh, just go and present you three slides with I believe, what I believe are three absolutely crucial ideas from the IO theory of innovation. So the first one would be the so-called replacement effect. So the idea is very sim simple, you know, uh, if you are already in the market by innovating, you're, uh, and if you're a technology leader, by any event, you, you will cannibalize your own product. And so therefore, everything else constant, this is important because there can be any other considerations, but every, everything else constant, uh, if you're a leader, you're gonna have lower incentives. And a lot of people refer to this as, as the arrow effect. I'm gonna call it arrow mark one because arrow in his 1962 paper I mean, only Arrow would do this. In one paper, he has two important ideas which came to be known as the Arrow Effect. 
So maybe I should run a poll and ask, what do you consider to be the error effect? I think there are <clears throat> two different ideas, related but actually different ideas that appear in Arrow 1962. So let's call this Arrow Mark I. Um, this is somewhat related to, uh, to Schumpeter's creative destruction, of course. And again, I'm also gonna call this Schumpeter Mark I because Schumpeter II had two very different ideas. Although in the case of Schumpeter, they're about 20 years apart. Um, uh, Schumpeter wasn't as quick as, as Arrow in this respect. So in the same paper, Arrow had these two fundamental ideas. Schumpeter had two different books where it presents this new fact. So creative destruction is Schumpeter's first big idea in terms of innovation, seems to me. So that's 1934. Um, now, if you want a more clear and um, common day formalization of that, so that would be Rankin in 1983. So this is probably what's going to be closest to what I'm doing here today. But it's the same idea. And it's a reasonably simple idea. I like to, you know, to present examples like Nintendo would be an example. This is Super Mario on your left. And it's a classical example of the replacement of that because in the 1980s, I know that's a long time ago, but in the 1980s, they had already developed a 32-bit machine, but they decided to hold on and not launch in the market because they said, listen, we still have a 16-bit machine, which is the dominant in market. If we were to introduce the 32-bit machine, we would just be, you know, basically cannibalizing our own 16-bit uh, machine. So that's a classical example of, um, of the uh, uh, replacement effect. In this case, not so much in terms of innovation of creating new product, but in terms of uh, uh, introducing it in the market. Okay, so that was my effect number one. Um, effect number two, uh, I would say the so-called joint profit effect. So at first, this may seem like it contradicts the previous one, but this, it does not. So on your left, you have Xerox's first plain paper photocopier, 1960s. This is a huge development. You know, people of a certain age still remember photocopiers that were done in, in, a, in a thermal paper that became yellow and curled up. It was horrible. Um, so uh, what is the joint profit effect? So the idea, and I'm using the Xerox example, um, is that after Xerox came up with the plain paper photocopier and patented it, of course, um, a lot of companies, including IBM, of course, they were green with envy because uh, it, you know it's a huge business to have a plain paper photocopier. And so they started investing a lot in trying to come up with an alternative technology that would not violate patent rights. But it turns out that the firm that spent the most in innovating alternative plain paper photocopying technologies was Xerox itself. And they literally had hundreds and hundreds of patents, none of which were used. So it's quite clear that those patents had a purely preemptive effect, making sure that no one else would uh, come up with those ideas. And eventually the FTC kind of said, this is anti-competitive, forced them to license it. But so the idea is that if you're a leader, you have more to lose from not innovating than the challenger has to gain from innovating. And this seems contradictory to the previous effect, but it's not. And, and um, I spend you know, part of my research career trying to show that these two effects are actually not contradictory. Um, one classical reference in here is, is uh, Gilbert Newbery. It's also known as deficiency effect. Tyrol calls it deficiency effect, which I think it's a horrible name. I mean, I love Jean and I think he's the smartest guy in the world, but not a very helpful uh, term in my opinion. Uh, joint profit effect, I think it's a much better, um, or uh, yeah, much better effect. So even though this is essentially a static model, there are dynamic versions of this effect. And in fact, uh, my paper is going to be uh, today a, a dynamic model. So it's going to refer to some of these dynamic papers. There's also a variation in this um, so-called joint profit effect, uh, what Agio and Howard refer to as uh, escape competition effect. But you know, it, it's not exactly exactly the same thing, but it's essentially the same thing. By the way, if you guys are interested in big, big philosophical ideas, I actually think that this effect, what's common to all of these papers, is essentially what in classical mechanics is the principle of least action, that a dynamic system tends to go in the direction that minimizes energy uh, spent. Um, and so that's what's going on in here as well. So that's the second idea. And finally, a third important idea in the history of the economics of innovation 
is what you might refer to as the innovator size effect. And this is a very simple idea. The higher your output level, the greater the value you have from a certain quality increase or a certain cost decrease. And this comes from the same error 1962 paper. And I'm going to refer to this as error mark two for lack of a better term, because this is different from the previous error effect that I talked about. And when people talk about error effect, they mean one of these two. And I would propose arrow mark one and arrow mark two because otherwise it's very confusing. This is also related to Schumpeter mark two. So Schumpeter years late after the uh, um, Creative Destruction book wrote another book. It seems like he's completely contradicting himself, but he's not. This is the book where he talks about how most of the great innovations in the 20th century were made by you know, very large corporations. So it was not a case of creative destruction. It was basically large firms doing it. And here's a photograph of the Bell Labs in New Jersey. You know, just think of all the innovation that was done there during the 20th century, the laser, the Unix operating system, uh, the uh, beginnings of the microprocessor and so forth. Uh, it's not exactly the same thing because Arrow is, 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 is all about incentives, whereas Schumpeter is about the ability. His point was that large firms have better ability than small firms. So these are three, I believe, very important ideas. Apologies again if I'm telling you the obvious, but I think it will be useful to uh, get this as a starting point to talk about what comes next. So what comes next is, let me tell you now, what is special about these digital industries that, in my opinion, in my opinion, warrants a, a separate approach. Um, by digital industries, I mean primarily uh, high tech, uh, industries that are platform based in a very, very broad notion of platform. So I think IBM, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Intel, they would all classify as, as tech giants in this, uh, in this context. And what is it that's special about them? Well, that's what comes next. I would say that a few things. First, you typically have dominant firms like Google, um, who are just under the gun as of today. Um, so sometimes I'll call it an industry leader, uh, call it a dominant firm, uh, whatever you want to call it. And if I had to model, of course, we always explain, you know, a model is basically a simplification of reality in which you capture some essential features. What would I consider to be the essential features of uh, a dominant firm in this context? I would say that uh, these are uh, firms that have complementary assets uh, and network effects. What I mean by complementary assets is that, you know, for example, Instagram by itself has much lower value than Instagram with Facebook. Because Instagram with Facebook is going to combine the value of Instagram with uh, complementary assets that Facebook has, for example, you know, a base, a user base that they already have. And, and that creates a value whereby the sum of the parts, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So this is one first important characteristic that I wanted to keep in mind. The second important characteristic is that the industry leader is not always the technology leader. So maybe think of, of, of Intel, one of the examples I had before. AMD frequently has been the technology leader in the market in certain, some, in certain segments. Uh, and clearly, you know, if you think of, um, I don't know, like um, um, Spotify versus uh, Google, what's the Google thing for music? I forget now. Um, uh, well, that's the point. I can't even, cannot even remember what they called. In other words, there may be several segments where the dominant firm is actually not the leader. And third, the technology leader may be acquired um, I mean, the, the terms of the, may be acquired by the industry leader. And as you know, this, I mean, just uh, if you look at GAFM, there's been something in the order of 900 acquisitions this century, a lot of them. Most of these you've probably never heard about, but there's been a lot of them. So these are some of the characteristics that I would like to focus on. And I think this is my claim to value added, as it were, with respect to the literature, because these are characteristics that have not been present uh, in much of the previous literature. So that kind of brings us to the title of the paper. So of course, the idea, the, the classic quote is from uh, Sir Isaac Newton, if I have seen far, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And I think that's a very nice quote. So I'm paraphrasing it by saying that 
what we see nowadays quite frequently is for giants to stand, stand on the shoulders of dwarfs. And, and this actually has two different meanings, both of which will be important today, both of which will be featured in the model. So the first interpretation is, is that the giant may imitate the, uh, um, the, uh, the, uh, the dwarf in a model of sequential innovation. So, um, you know, Microsoft Internet Explorer basically, you know, just took Netscape and, and just adapted it to the Microsoft operating system. They, I mean, the value added by Microsoft Internet Explorer, it's probably very close to zero. Uh, if you talk to anybody who knows anything about browsers, that's what it will tell you. Uh, and between Intel and AMD, you also have a lot of copying, which by the way, goes both ways. Uh, Google Play, that's the name that I was looking for. They basically, they tried to basically copy Spotify. It turns out it didn't work very well, but they tried. So this is one first uh, interpretation of standing on the shoulders of dwarfs. The second one is just uh, acquisition, markets for technology. So Google just buys Waze. They, they don't copy Waze, they just buy it. Facebook, they don't copy Instagram, they just buy it. One of my favorite examples, by the way, of the uh, joint profit effect is uh, Ellie Lilly and Genentech. And uh, if you guys uh, have time, uh, I really recommend this book. Um, I think it's called Invisible Frontiers. Uh, which is a, um, it's a really nice book. It's, it's quite a thriller, I should say, about the discovery of um, uh, synthetic insulin. And um, but the book itself is very interesting. That would be a different paper. But for the purposes of, um, uh, and by the way, I said it in a different paper on, on um, R&D races. But for the purposes of, of today is that the winner of this rate is Genentech. They're the first firm to come up with synthetic insulin. And what is interesting is that within uh, 24 hours, I believe it was 24 hours of Genentech filing for a patent, they sold the patent to Ellie Lilly. And who's Ellie Lilly? Well, Ellie Lilly was the dominant firm in the market for animal insulin. And so you might think, well, they're, 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 they're cannibalizing their own market share. Yes, they are. But the, the, the uh, joint profit effect is really playing a big role in here. Ellie Lilly has more to lose from letting Pfizer or Merck come in the market than Pfizer or Merck have to gain from entering this market. And that's why Ellie Lilly uh, have the most to um, gain from acquiring that patent. This is probably the best example in my opinion for a giblet numeracy. They chose Xerox, but I think Ellie Lilly and Genentech is probably an even better example. So just to go over that, I mean, the imitation thing, um, I mean, it's big. If you look at Microsoft Office, there is nothing in Office that Microsoft has invented. Trust me. It's all copied from third parties. Um, and, 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 and I mean, I'm not just picking on Microsoft in here because I don't like Microsoft. Uh, as it happens, I don't. But uh, I, I could say the same thing about many other corporations. And, and, and so this leads to what I later refer to as the uh, uh, shadow of Google effect which uh, basically it's the idea that, and I mean, I'm using Google in here because it's a more common and current name, that a huge uh, uh, danger of um, inventing, innovating in this space is that one of the giants will just copy you and then will take all of that value. Because remember, patents are relatively weak ways of protecting IP in software. So it's very difficult to, um, very difficult, uh, short of a trade secret to, uh, to sort of keep that to yourself. So that's kind of one uh, you can already see in here that this is going to have a, you know, a negative effect on innovation. But then, you know, you have the other one, you have acquisition, you know, if you talk to, if you talk to Uri Levin from Waze, uh, he probably doesn't mind the fact that Google is such a big guy because uh, Google just uh, paid him uh, $1.1 billion. So that's not bad. I mean, for a small startup from Tel Aviv, uh, that's not bad at all. So uh, we have a lot of examples, you know, like Genentech and Ellie Lilly, Android and Google, AdSense and Google, Facebook and Instagram, Google and Waze, where relatively small entrants, French firms, maybe even startups, made a ton of money um, uh, through that. And um, 
You know, I'm currently the chief economist at uh, one of these uh, accelerators here in New York City, the Endless Frontier Labs. And I mean, it's something that I, I've seen dozens and dozens of startups, and it's clearly not for all, but for a large number of them, it's part of their business model. They want to be acquired by a giant, by someone, but in particular, they're thinking frequently about a giant. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's just their business model. So whereas the first effect seems to be very negative in terms of innovation, the second, in fact, you know, it's, it's positive to the extent that, you know, the price by, for which I'm selling my firm, my technology, is, is my incentive to innovate. So you can already see where, where I'm going with all of this. Um, let me just conclude this uh, a very long introduction by telling you that this choice between imitation and acquisition is not obvious. And so if you think of Google's main revenue source, which is uh, online advertising. Well, some of what they have, some of their technology was actually um, purchased. They acquired uh, Applied Semantics, for example, to get AdSense. Uh, but they tried to acquire Idea Lab. They wouldn't, you know, Idea Lab wouldn't sell. So eventually they imitated. They were sued in court, but eventually settled out of court. Actually, sorry, I think this is wrong. Actually, I'm not sure whether it was in court or out of court, but it was certainly in the shadow of the litigation. Uh, it was, they, they, they settled for, for a transfer, which something in the order of $2 billion, uh, which is peanuts. I mean, in retrospect, it was peanuts for, for, for Google. So um, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, uh, in some cases, acquisition is easier. In some other cases, it's not so easy. And so I will be considering both, both possibilities today. Um, policy relevance, you know, as of today, I think I got a little bit of a, uh, uh, an, an additional encouragement because, you know, I've been writing a lot about this in policy circles. And, and, and I think that, uh, I, unfortunately, there's not, in my opinion, not enough theory, not enough economics, uh, economic theories of harm, and in particular, not enough in terms of effects on innovation. So, of course, today's uh, suit that was announced by uh, the U.S. Department of Justice by William Barr, uh, it does mention uh, innovation primarily because, you know, um, it's very hard to talk about Google setting very high prices because politically that's a very difficult, tough sell because, of course, we don't pay Google directly any money course, we pay indirectly through higher prices of everything else because of the cost of advertising that gets passed on to goods. But uh, perhaps because the fear of harm in terms of prices is not an easy sell, they're going to be putting some weight on innovation in this case as well. Uh, but I would claim that uh, there's no good theory of harm when it comes to innovation. And, and, and so that, that's sort of part of the overall motivation for, for what I'm doing in here. Okay, so that concludes my very long introduction. So perhaps I should just stop in here for, for a second and see if there are any um, comments, uh, questions, suggestions, complaints. I have a question. Okay. Uh, hi, this is Reiko. Hey, Reiko. Hi, how are you? Um, Good. The, um, maybe you won't answer this question, but you define what a dominant firm is in the beginning. And it's uh, just so, yeah, I really did not. I just said that, okay. you know, um, they're characterized by having some, uh, some essential asset, which is complementary to a lot of the other uh, um, assets that are uh, developed in the industry. So, I mean, for Google, I would say that their, their main asset is their search engine. For uh, Facebook is their user base. For Apple, I would say it's probably their app store, the fact that they control an app store. Uh, for Amazon, I think is um, it's their platform. So uh, the firms, they, it's sort of like an essential facility to use the telecommunications company, uh, telecommunications terminology. So uh, a dominant firm is a firm that owns an, a, a, a critical asset, which is complementary to other uh, assets that are uh, created through innovation. I know this is a little vague, but um, um, uh, that's the best. 
So would Eli really have done that? Oh, no. Uh, well, uh, uh, it's a good question. They were dominant because they did, uh, uh, what is that they did have? They had a, um, basically had the distribution network of, uh, of uh, insulin. You know, it, uh, it's, it's a very difficult asset because you have to know your, um, your diabetic patients. You have to know how to distribute, how to... Uh, uh, Genetic, they couldn't possibly do that. They were just a bunch of, uh, of medical, uh, of doctors from Stanford and the University of California. They wouldn't know how to sell insulin. Okay. So uh, you're right that in this case, it's not very clear what that asset is. I guess it was their distribution network, probably. Ah, okay. I'm satisfied with that answer. You're, 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 you chose the most difficult example for me. Well, but you can guess, you know, from an antitrust point of view, it could be pretty important when you're trying to apply your yeah. model, for instance, for a particular situation. Yeah. So in the model, I'll be a little more clear about what I mean by dominant front. But uh, oh. um, uh, in general terms, this is what I have in mind. Great. Okay, so, so let's talk about the model then. So before I actually show you the details, the research questions I want to ask is, suppose that a Martian lands on planet Earth, at a random time of history, because I'm gonna be looking at a steady state of a model. And what innovation rate will the Martian find? Um, and by the way, uh, if the European Union and the US were separated, which they're not, but if they were, would uh, the Martian find a different um, um, innovation rate in one case or the other? Or if you wanna put it differently, if there was a planet that were more like Europe and another planet that were more like the US in the past 20 years, would the Martian find a different innovation rate in each planet? Okay, and also would that rate differ a lot if you were in a planet where technology transfer were easier? Okay, so these are the kind of research questions that I think are quite relevant that I wanna see. So. In terms of motivating the actual moving parts of the model, let me just talk to you about a couple of examples. One is going back to the uh, Netscape and Internet Explorer example. So if you look at the history of uh, uh, browsers in the 1990s, there was rapid development and improvement of the browsers. New features were con con you know, routinely added like JavaScript, HTML, uh, CSS implementation and so forth. So that's one first thing. And the second one, um, again, I already mentioned that, is the complementary asset. So Microsoft, they can, with the same value of browser, they can go a, a much farther because they can, you know, they can complement that with their operating system. So this is an important feature that I'm going to want to have in my model. The second feature, and I'm going to use microprocessors as an example, here's, the, uh, here's Moore's law. So this is the uh, speed in log of uh, millions of instructions per second. <clears throat> over time, so this is kind of log linear, which is uh, Moore's law, uh, which is fine. But the thing that I wanted to notice in here is that it's sort of like a band. In other words, that in each moment in time, there's a range of speeds. Uh, and it's sort of like there's a, like a constant lag between the fastest and the, sh and, the, and, the, and, 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 the and the slowest in the market. And so um, there's a quality ladder, but there's sort of like an imita imitation with a quality lag. Like, uh, you know, if I was in here and, and we moved in here and you're now that far, I can sort of like catch up with you at a certain lag. And I want, I want to model that as well. Actually, this is a lot of models use this, uh, this kind of feature. I'm not very novel in that. So with those examples in mind, uh, uh, the assumptions that I'm going to make in terms of my model is that there's a well-defined vertical ladder. You can think of uh, microprocessor speed, uh, the size of, uh, of a photocopier or the number of features of a browser, or stuff like that, which I'm going to use it, you know, think of it as being in, in, in a real line, but it could be something else. Um, there's going to be a technology laggard who can imitate up to, imitate for free, by the way, up to a certain distance from the leader. This is a, an assumption that you find in, in, in uh, Aguillon, uh, Howitt, uh, you find it, uh, 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 Seagull, Winston, uh, at least in those two papers that uh, use, uh, that, that, that are similar to what I will have here today. And uh, um, so far, there's gonna be a market leader, uh, a dominant firm, if you will, which will be fixed for now until 
a later section in which I will consider competition for the market in addition to competition within the market. So right now it's only the technology leader that varies over time. Okay, so let me now be even more specific. Uh, my model has continuous time, has two firms and two states. The, state, the states are, uh, the dominant firm is the firm M and the front firm is firm F. They can either be the technology leader or the technology laggard. So there's one state where the dominant firm is the technology leader and the fringe firm is the technology laggard. And there's a state where the dominant firm is the technology laggard and the fringe firm is the technology leader. So, you know, you could say this is state one to state two, but I will uh, keep these as, as, as the uh, subscripts for those states. And so innovation is what makes you a technology leader in this model. And in uh, much of the paper, I will be contrasting two possible extremes. One in which there's no technology transfer at all. The other one where there's efficient and costless technology transfer through Nash bargaining. Of course, the world is somewhere in between these two extremes, but uh, you know, for the sake of uh, simplicity, I'll consider these two extremes. And so um, I will then have, uh, for firm strategy, I'm going to choose the rate of innovation. This is just like in the Ray Genome model, for example, this is, and many other models of, of innovation in continuous time. Um, um, Reiko herself had some work on that, although I think you had in discrete time, wasn't it? I think it was in discrete time, if I recall. So uh, you can choose an innovation rate in continuous time, and you do that with a cost function. This is a cost flow in continuous time, and I denotes whether I'm the uh, dominant firm or the fringe firm, and K, my technology position, either I'm the technology leader or technology laggard. There's also profit flow, uh, gross of innovation cost given by pi i k. And in this context, firm value, uh, you know, think about it. In, in, in a given instant in time, this is the flow that I'm going to be looking at. It's my profit flow minus my cost of innovation flow. And then this is the hazard rate for me to be the next innovator, in which case we transit to a state in which I'm the technology leader. And this is the hazard rate of you innovating, in which case we transit to a state in which I'm the technology lagger. And of course, you can simplify that to this. Uh, and and, and, and um, okay, so this would be the, uh, the valid function in this model. So of course, I now I need to put some structure on this function in here and on this function in here, because otherwise there's not much I can tell you uh, uh, at this level. I need to put some structure on this. And that's what I'm going to do next. And so, you know, I'm actually reasonably proud of the fact that I'm making fairly weak assumptions on, on these functions. So at this point, I'm going to have to introduce you a parameter alpha. So I'm going to use alpha as a parameter that measures asymmetry between firm M, the dominant firm, and firm F, the, fr the, the French firm. So part A is to say that the dominant firm's payoff and this applies also to the French firm, is strictly increasing or decreasing in alpha. So alpha is an indicator of the uh, uh, asymmetry between, between uh, um, dominant firm and French firm. Okay. Um, second assumption, this is the one that has more bytes. So the first one is just a convention. The second one is that this is convex in alpha. And this is not an innocuous assumption. This plays an enormous role in this paper, but it's satisfied by most IO models. You know, your typical IO model is going to have convexity and profit function. In fact, Gilbert Newbery also explored this uh, property uh, uh, to a great extent. And finally, we're going to have a limit condition that if there's a lot of asymmetry, eventually the French firm makes zero profits. As to the cost function, I'm normalizing cost of zero to be zero. Uh, and uh, Actually, this now is not a normalization, but the marginal cost is also zero. And then for positive uh, hazard rates of innovation, I'm assuming that uh, of course cost increasing and con convex. And I'm using this assumption in here that the third derivative is positive is just to make sure that the solution is interior. And otherwise, this is not very important, uh, but it just guarantees that I have an interior solution. And later on, I'm going to consider quadratic cost functions, in which case this is not true, 
So I know that later on I will violate assumption two, but I only violate in this aspect in here. And this is only important to assure, ensure that there's a, a, an interior solution. When I work with it with a, with a quadratic cost function, I have to manually check that the, the uh, uh, I'm not at a corner solution. Okay, um, my results are analytical, but I will present you graphs and uh, um, examples with numerical uh, cases. And when I do that, I will use a quadratic function for the cost function. And for the profit function, I will use a nice model, which is a discrete choice model. There's a continuum of consumers and they choose to purchase from the firm that gives them the higher utility net of price. Um, where um, alpha is uh, either positive alpha or negative alpha, depending on where the dominant firm. So, so this is the dominant firm. Uh, consumers like to buy from the dominant firm because of the so-called complementary assets, everything else constant, but they also like to buy from the technology leader. They don't like price. And this is a, a random preference shock, which is normally distributed. You know, in your empirical work, typically this uh, um, Zeta, I think that's what this is, or Zeta, if you're in Australia, New Zealand, I believe. Uh, the Zeta is um, typically uh, is as an extreme value distribution. Uh, you do that because it's just nicer, but you know, I put it normal because normal is it's, it's just kind of more normal. What can I say? So I use normal distribution. Um, there's one exception, proposition six, where I'm assuming a quadratic, quadratic cost function. So one of the reasons why this paper is still under review is that the editor is giving me a very hard time with proposition six. So I've been working hard on um, trying to make it more general and it's the only proposition right now that I have to make a bunch of assumptions. This is a really hard result, really hard. So we'll get to that later on. So I'll be very interested in the steady state innovation rate. Uh, so this is just a harmonic rate. If you showed it, it's, it's, uh, um, it's not exactly the harmonic rate, it's, it's the average of the two innovation rates where the weights, it is the harmonic uh, uh, rate, I think. I think that's what it's called. So it comes to this. So I will be interested in knowing how the individual innovation rates and the market innovation rate depend on alpha. Okay, so this is the hazard rate that one individual firm innovates. This is the hazard rate that some in, uh, firm innovates. Okay. And this is what I would be interested from a social, social point of view. And so I mean, I'll be very interested in this mapping. Okay, so um, the first two sets of results, how am I doing in terms of timing? Um, I'm doing okay. Uh, by the way, feel free to interrupt me because uh, I think we're doing okay in terms of time. So first of all, uh, the leading firm, the dominant firm uh, increases its innovation when it becomes more dominant and the laggard firm reduces when it becomes, when, uh, uh, becomes a smaller firm. This is not super surprising. This is straight out of arrow mark one. You know, the bigger you are, the more you have to gain from being a technology leader. Because that innovation, you know, um, if I'm Instagram and I'm going by myself, you know, getting a better technology, I have so few customers, there's only so much money I can get out of that innovation. If I'm Facebook and I have a gazillion users, any innovation that I have, uh, it's going to be, um, it's going to accrue a lot of profit. So this is not very surprising. What is perhaps surprising is that there exists an alpha prime such that if alpha prime is, uh, if alpha is greater than alpha prime, then the uh, social innovation rate is actually lower than it would be under symmetry. And by the way, it's also decreasing. I could also show that. This is a little surprising because by convexity the profit function, this increase is bigger than this decrease. This is what makes this result, in my opinion, kind of interesting from a theoretical point of view because it, it is a little surprising. So let me show that uh, the results aren't analytical, but I, I'm showing it here numerically. So this is the innovation rate by the dominant firm. 
Oh, by the way, on the horizontal axis, I have alpha. So it's a measure of the symmetry between dominant and dominant firm. So at zero, this is symmetry. This is symmetric situation. As I increase this symmetry, the dominant firm's incentives to innovate go up. The fringe firm's incentives go down. If you were simply to compute the uh, simple average between the two, it would actually go up. This is because of uh, both the uh, uh, firm size effect, which is in here, and the joint profit effect. But the point is, this is a very important point, the average innovation rate is not the same thing as the steady state innovation rate. The steady state innovation rate is the harmonic mean, not the simple mean. And that goes down. And that is very important. And, and the reason is, this, it's actually, it's quite, this is the most difficult part of the entire paper to explain. The reason why the harmonic mean is decreasing while the simple mean goes up is the following. Because of the replacement effect, the first order effects are going to come from the technology laggards. The dominant firm as a technology laggard is going to invest a lot and more and more as alpha increases. The uh, fringe firm is going to invest less and less when it's the technology laggard. We got it. But now, here's the important point. Along the steady state, the French firm is going to be the technology laggard much more often. That means that I should put a lot more weight on blue than on green. And that's why I get red. The simple mean is very nice, but doesn't have any meaning in a steady state. In a steady state, one half, one half are not the right weights. The right weights are you're going to put more and more weight in the blue line and less and less weight on the green line. So, um, okay, maybe I went a little too quickly. This, I believe it's one of the more subtle points of the paper and kind of shows how dynamics are important in order to uh, derive this result. Uh, and it's complicated. There's a lot going on in here. The replacement effect, the uh, firm size effect and so forth. So an increase in the degree of firm dominance leads to a decrease in innovation. Uh, I, I'm kind of in here. I'm repeating the steps that I gave you before that lead to that curve. So, you know, just as a brief digression, if you go back to the U.S. versus Microsoft 1998, so here's actually this is actually Bill Gates testifying uh, before court in 1998, and he doesn't look very happy, and in fact he had reasons not to be very happy that day. Because, uh, as you know, the, you know, the, it was, uh, uh, you know, they were, um, they lost the case, effectively. Even though then George Bush just said, forget about it, in two, two years later. But they did lose the case. But in a very important pillar of Microsoft's defense, and, and uh, 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 you know, Dick Schmalensee was one of the leaders of, of that team, is that, you know, because we're big, we have big incentives to improve quality. This was very much part of their, their defense. And if you come back in here, that is true. This is what Dick Schmalensi was saying. Listen, the fact that we're so big means that we have an enormous incentive to innovate. And that's true. Uh, in fact, you talk about we are paranoid. This was a word that he used several times. We are paranoid uh, of being left behind. And in fact, the model shows that, yes, when you're behind, you're going to be investing like crazy. But the point is that this is not the only effect. You also have to take into account the discouragement effect on other firms. And this discouragement effect dominates this encouragement effect. So uh, even though this goes up, uh, in fact, X goes down with alpha. So this is uh, the first uh, uh, set of results that I have in a paper. Um, and, and um, subtle to some extent, but I think, I think important. Okay, so let's move on. Unless there are questions, let's move on to the second set of results. Okay, this, the second thing that you observe in this industry is a lot of acquisitions. So he, you know, if just the GAFA, just the four top, it's already close to 900 since the beginning of the century. A lot of them, especially Google here in red. By the way, uh, none of these were blocked by justice, and only like one or two were reviewed. This is, people talk a lot about this. 
Uh, and we could talk about that later on if you want. So big guy eats small guy. This happens a lot in this industry. So that's the next thing that I want to talk about is the acquisition movement. And so I'm going to change the model by allowing uh, acquisition. What is acquisition? Acquisition is the following. If we're ever in the state where the dominant firm is the technology ladder, laggard, then the technology laggard buys the technology from the French firm and they switch their technology positions. So uh, they instantaneously move to state MT and FL. And they do that by paying a price P. So this is the price of technology transfer, which I assume comes out of Nash bargaining. Now I'm not, you know, I'm gonna spare you the details of deriving the Nash bargaining price. It's not trivial because it's a Nash bargaining price when you have value function. And so in other words, the outside option, you have, it's a value function. So you have to consider an outside continuation game uh, if there, there is no agreement, but I mean, it's, it's two pages, it's not more than that. Um, and essentially what we have then is that the value, uh, if you're um, the French firm and your technology laggard is, well, if you innovate, you immediately go back to the same state, but you get a price P from, being, uh, from selling your technology to the leader and you get the profit flow as before and you, get, you pay that cost. Uh, so that, that's how you change now the value function. And likewise, for the dominant firm, you're just waiting for the, a French firm to innovate, and then I will capture I will, that technology so that I remain a technology leader. I have to pay the price P. Okay, so that's that, that's how you're now going to change the model. Um, and so, what results do I have for this? Well, first of all, this is actually it's more like a lemma, really. Um, this is the two pages that I mentioned, you know, deriving, deriving the equilibrium price. It's a bit, a bit cumbersome, but uh, it can be done, um, well, I'd say in, in, in exact form, but of course, uh, 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 this is endogenous. So, I mean, I, I, it's not, a, it's a lemma. This is not a result, you know. It's not P as a function of exogenous parameters, but it's a helpful, a helpful lemma. Let's talk about the results though. Um, if there's enough asymmetry, if the dominant firm is sufficiently big, then when there is technology transfer, the innovation rate is now strictly increasing in alpha. So it's exactly the opposite of what I had before. Recall that before it was declining, whereas now I'm telling you that it's strictly increasing. Okay. Moreover, um, and I'll talk about that, if alpha is very small, then it is strictly decreasing. So this is kind of nice because it shows that this is not obvious, but I, have a, um, I don't have a clear partition in terms of alpha, but I know that if, uh, if, if alpha is sufficiently small, then it's, decrease, it's, it's decreasing. If alpha is sufficiently high, then it's increasing. Uh, I cannot have a if and only if result on alpha, at, not at this level of generality. And so uh, here's the result. Without technology transfer, this is from before, recall that? I showed you this before. Here's the new one. And here's the interesting thing, this is, you know, uh, you cannot see it in here, but they do cross. In fact, I'll show you, that this is what it looks like for very small values of alpha. So let's talk about the economics of this. First of all, why is this greater than that? And why is this increasing while this is decreasing? So this is the innovation for buyout effect. I'm definitely not the first person to talk about innovation for buyout. But I think it's, I mean, I think this paper pla places this clearly in the context of um, a dynamic model of innovation with, with asymmetry. And so this is what I observe in, 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 in these uh, uh, accelerators, bunch of uh, young uh, entrepreneurs uh, for whom their business model is, is uh, you know, basically trying to sell, exit, exit strategy. And so um, the idea is that um, because of efficient Nash bargaining, there, there, there's uh, um, 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 the fringe firm partly internalizes the dominant firm's higher incentives. Let me put it differently. 
once you compute the, you know, the vast bargaining price, you're going to split the gains from an agreement by both parties. And the price is going to reflect both of those gains. That means that if Google has a lot to gain from acquiring my technology, the price will partly reflect that. Of course, it's going to depend on what is the relative bargaining of Google and, and myself. But um, I'm getting a piece of that cake. I'm getting a piece of the value that Google is, is getting. This is uh, really the important intuition. It's, I think, relatively simpler than the first result, but it's a very powerful intuition that leads to, a, to, to, a, to, this, to this result in here. The part that is probably not so obvious is the bargaining power effect. It's this effect, that for a very small value of alpha, um, the innovation rate with technology transfer is actually lower than with technology transfer. So this is an empirical question, you know, how low is this value of alpha? This is an empirical question. But what is the intuition for what goes on in here? And it is without technology transfer, the joint profit effect, which is really what drives the result uh, in there. Um, I'm sorry, what am I saying? The, uh, um, the asymmetry effect that you find in the first result is of second order for very low values of alpha. In fact, it starts at the derivative equal to zero. So uh, if you're close to symmetry at the beginning, that asymmetry that I talked about in the first propositions uh, does not kick in. However, if there is technology transfer, the uh, um, differences in um, bargaining power kick in from the very beginning between dominant firm and fringe firm. And because what matters essentially is the incentive for the small firm, uh, it starts going down before it starts going up. Okay, perhaps I, not super clear in here. We need to go through the actual details of the model to uh, go through this uh, more clearly. But um, it's really about, if you want, bargaining power. The French firm uh, has lower and lower bargaining power as alpha increases. Eventually, the fact that the pie is so big counterbalances that effect. But for very small values of alpha, the increase in the pie is, sec is a second order effect. And it's the decline in market power that dominates. And that makes this decreasing in here. So this is gonna be U-shaped. So I find this kind of interesting. And I, had never, I at least I'm not aware of, 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 of this uh, having been uh, um, shown before. Luis? Oh, That's yes. It. Does that mean in a world where Oracle and um, and Google are competing um, to acquire the um, the innovation of a small company, you would have that no tech transfers are leading to more innovation? So uh, that's a good question. So in my model, I don't have that. I only have one dominant firm. So yeah. if I had more than one dominant firm competing for that, that basically would increase the bargaining power of the smaller firm. And I would expect, yes, I would expect this negative effect to be diminished or maybe even uh, canceled. Was that your question? Yes, yes, that was the question. Yeah, so I think that's correct, but it, I don't have that in my model. That's a good, uh, that would be an interesting extension. Okay, speaking of extensions, and I'm, I think I'm doing okay in terms of time, I'm going to now go now to my uh, final result. And that's extending this to the possibility of radical innovation. So, so far, the, um, um, my dominant firm is all of my dominant firm, but suppose that in addition to investing X uh, in uh, um, 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 incremental innovation, I could also invest Y into radical innovation. Now, I mean, I know when I start talking about that, people say that, oh, you know, how do I know if I'm investing in uh, incremental or radical? Of course, we never know. Models are always simplifications of reality. I think what I'm assuming in here is that when you choose a certain research path, you know that it's more likely or less likely to lead to either more incremental or more radical innovation. So 
what I mean by radical innovation is the next Google. Okay, uh, uh, it's not a better search engine. It's something else. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's, uh, in my opinion, it's probably going to be related to AI. It's just a new way of, of doing AI, of using data uh, that uh, really revolutionizes and makes you the new, the new uh, critical asset. Uh, but it could be something else. If I knew, I wouldn't be here, of course. So, but let's assume that you can do that. And then this is the result that I'm having a hard time because this result, I'm the first one to admit, um, is not as general as the previous results. Uh, but basically, you know, uh, it, it, it provides conditions such that the rate of radical innovation under techno no technology transfer is increasing in alpha and strictly greater than under technology transfer. So let me put this in plain English. <clears throat> what I'm showing in here is that the good things that I've been talking to about technology transfer and the effect that it has on incremental innovation, well, put a minus sign on that. Uh, the effect on radical innovation is the opposite. And this is an effect that, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is kind of a novel effect. I'm calling it the complacency effect. It's kind of similar to the replacement effect, but I actually think it's different. So here's the idea. Let me try to explain that in English. If there is technology transfer, as we saw earlier, my benefits from uh, doing incremental innovation go up as a French firm. And also, uh, the difference in payoffs between the French firm and the dominant firm becomes smaller. Uh, partly because, you know, Nash bargaining kind of internalizes some of those gains. And so there's a little bit of redistribution. This is hugely important because it means that the opportunity costs of radical innovation becomes smaller. Or if you will, the advantage of becoming a dominant firm as opposed to a French firm is not that big. Let me put it in plain English. I'm just a startup in Tel Aviv. And we'll say, gee, why don't you try to be the next Google? And my reaction is, listen, with technology transfer, with the option of selling to Google, it's actually not a bad idea. You know, I just uh, I do a startup, I sell to Google, and then, you know, I'll just do another startup. So, you know, life is good my incentives for radical innovation are rather low. If there were no technology transfer, then my incentives for gradual innovation would be really small. Why? I do some incremental innovation and Google will just copy me, will imitate me. And I say, shucks, I might as well then just go for the moonshot. I want to be the next Google. It's no good to be. So this is what I call the complacency effect. If you make technology transfer very easy, you're actually reducing the incentives for radical innovation. So to put, to put it differently, I'm showing that there, there's a, uh, there's a trade-off between X incremental innovation and Y radical innovation. Um, and part of uh, the problems that I'm having in uh, revising this paper is First, I still don't have a very good way of comparing this trade-off, and I have a proposition six that is not jolly enough. So I'm working on that. Okay, um, it's uh, it's one hour already, so I'm uh, going to start, uh, uh, you know, uh, winding down and 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 uh, getting close to being done. So a little bit of uh, empirical evidence of of, of this. Um, so there's a, a paper that it's not published, it's still a working paper by uh, my colleague, Petra Moser, and a former student of hers. And um, they show that one Monsanto, it's a very nice natural experiment, by the way. So for empiricists, this would be a very ni nice paper. But the bottom line, they show that one Monsanto accidentally, as it accidentally enters into the soybean uh, seed market. Um, the uh, by acquisition, by the way, um, 
the innovation rate of the Monsanto acquired firms goes up, but the innovation rate of all the other ones goes down and the total industry innovation rate goes down. So this is very consistent with the shadow of Google effect. Okay, proposition two. Uh, this paper by uh, Wetzinger et al, that includes uh, Monica Schnitzer and uh, I forget the other co-authors, but I have this at the end of the slides if you're interested. Um, looks also in, uh, with historical data uh, and basically they uh, come up with results that are also very consistent with the Shagor Google effect. Um, there's a, a QJE paper by Alberto Galasso and Mark Schenkerman and um, to cut a long story short, they, they kind of show that uh, whenever alpha is very high, whenever there's biggest symmetry between buyer and seller in technology transfer, that um, bargaining frictions are greater. And this is kind of consistent with something like the bargain effect, bargaining power effect that I mentioned earlier. So it goes to show that when I said that if alpha is very small, then things could go the other way around. Uh, it's actually possible that uh, this is not such an exception, considering this sort of evidence. This may actually be an important effect. Um, so, discussion, you know, um, I can discuss this a little bit in terms of robustness if you're interested. I think there's an interesting uh, interpretation of the literature in here. There, there's a no literature on the persistence of leadership and, and Gilbert and Newberry were very instrumental in that. Uh, my paper kind of makes the distinction that one thing is who innovates, the other thing is who owns the technology. Once you have technology transfer, you have to make this distinction. So there's precision of leadership in terms of ownership, but not in terms of innovation, for example. And I think that's an important distinction. Um, and as you can see, this paper kind of, my paper also shows that this distinction between incremental and radical can be quite important when, once you look into, into this. And this is an area where I still have some work, some work to do. Um, welfare analysis this is another complaint by the ed, the, the editor, uh, and I agree. There's no welfare analysis. There will be hopefully in the future, in the future version of this paper. Uh, this is still working progress. Years later, I don't know when um, Simona saw this first, but it's already been a few years. We're still working on it. I mean, finally. I, I, <laughs> I actually think that this is pretty important from the point of view of public policy. So I've been writing um, a lot on this and we can talk more about that. In particular, I've been very active and vocal and somewhat controversial talking about issues of acquisitions. I'm very much in the minority in here and I mean the majority is certainly um, very highly qualified more than I am. But I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of doubling down on that kind of thing. Um, and anyway, I think the policy implications of all these are important once you look carefully at the issues of innovation. So what do I mean by implications? First of all, the treatment of dominant firms can be thought of as a way of changing the value of alpha, the degree of asymmetry between dominant firm and, 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 and the French firm. So in Europe, for example, there's been a lot of policy to lower the value of alpha. Uh, forcing firms to pay fines, uh, behavioral remedies, and so forth, all of those go in the direction of reducing the value of, of alpha. And the current uh, um, super commissaire, uh, Mark Verstager, uh, has really changed the value of alpha compared, for example, with the previous, previous uh, uh, chief economist, uh, not chief economist, previous commissioner, uh, Joaquin Almunia. So I think Europe has been a huge pressure for lowering the value of alpha. Whereas the US has been the opposite up to now, up to yesterday for you guys, up to, up to today for me, there really hasn't been anything uh, in terms of public policy regarding alpha. Let's see what happens now with, with the uh, Google, Google case. Now, the thing where there's been a lot of discussion and where I'm very much in the minority, I'm kind of a, uh, really the, uh, the lone ranger in here, is merger policy. So there's a very strong movement in uh, uh, both in Europe and in North America. <clears throat> I don't know about um, Australia and New Zealand um, to uh, radically change merger policy with respect to uh, digital giants. And in particular, the idea of reversing the, board, the burden of proof in a merger. 
So if you want to merge, you have to show that your merger um, is pro-competitive. I don't know what's happening in Japan either. Maybe Rekha can tell us. I think this would be a big mistake, especially in the US. Because, I mean, mergers play an enormous role uh, in terms of technology transfer. So I think this would be a big mistake. And I think there are many ways of taking care of market power, in particular regulation. I think this is a clear case for regulation, uh, all sorts of regulation, including uh, um, anything that has to do with foreclosure, which, by the way, is what the uh, government is, is going after today, is uh, tie-ins and, and stuff like that. Um, in terms of pricing, I think, why not regulate um, the fees in the App Store? Why not regulate the advertising rates charged by Google and Facebook? I mean, we, we've done that for credit cards. We've done that for telecommunications. I think the, the time has come for us to consider Google as a public utility. And so don't, you know, I think the reversing the burden of proof emerges is barking at the wrong tree. Anyway, I, I could go on this forever. Um, um, but I think um, the theoretical analysis that I'm doing has something to do with this. Um, so so there, there, there's, there's a lot of interesting public policy implications. So I think I'll stop here um, a few minutes uh, before uh, time, but uh, in this way, uh, I have the references in here. In this way, uh, if, there, if there are any additional questions, perhaps we, um, we, we can get to that. So I will um, perhaps at least temporarily stop sharing and see if, um, any questions or comments or complaints? <laughs>